Hey, everybody. Welcome to the I Love OT podcast. My name is Michael Robertson. I love OT. Welcome to episode 11. Teen, why OT is better than PT. We're going to get into the... Wait, wait, wait. Really? I'm sorry. I hear another voice. Hello? Wait a second. Wait a second. Michael, it's the OT for Life podcast. Oh, I'm... Wow. Oh, I'm sorry. I just force a habit, I guess. I uh, put on the headset and... It just comes out. Joining us, we have Dr. Michael Roberts. Michael is just one of those people that is so passionate about everything occupational therapy, and it shows throughout our discussion today. He shares a wealth of insight from his experiences as an occupational therapist, from starting the graduate OT program at Regis College, as well as his clinical background in adult physical rehabilitation. Michael is also the host of the I Love OT podcast. And if you haven't checked it out yet, you definitely need to. Holy moly, we have just an awesome chat today. And yeah, let's find out why he loves OT. If you're interested in occupational therapy, this is the place for you. This show aims to explore our profession by sharing who we are and what we do. Because for us, occupational therapy is more than just a job. Hi, I'm Sarah. Welcome to OT for Life. Hello. How's it going? Excellent. Good. Good. I feel like I should be asking you, um, your your business is very important to us. Please hold the line. <laughs> Press one for, you know, it seems like that kind of thing with a headphone and the little, yeah, it's just, yeah. OTs don't generally wear a headset and microphone. This is, no. This is a new world. No. As long as you Holy don't play the, <laughs> I was just going to say, don't play the crappy music, but that was actually fantastic <laughs> music. So if you want to keep going, I'll, 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 I'll sit on hold. <laughs> no, no, no. That's, that's perfectly all right. I've never been accused, no matter, no matter how many times I've done musical theater, I've never been accused of having a good singing voice. Well, I am really excited to have you on today. This, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. That's awesome. Me too. I mean, I'm excited to talk to you, not I'm excited to talk to me. That's, that would make no sense. Well, I'm excited to talk to you, and sometimes I'm excited to talk to myself. But <laughs> <laughs> So I... I'm curious. I want to get a little snapshot about what your OT life looks like right now. Uh, well, honestly, education is my practice right now uh, because I have, I'm here at Regis College in beautiful Weston, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. And um, we founded the program about three years ago. We were fully accredited as of l last April. And I am not working clinically anymore because I'm here putting together this fantastic program, but it's a fantastic opportunity for me. I built the program from the ground up, wrote the curriculum, wrote the syllabi, handpicked all the students, handpicked all the faculty. And so my OT life is building, growing, and running our master's degree program in occupational therapy here at Regis. That is so fascinating. Because I feel like I'm a busy person, and then hearing you talk, I'm like, whoa, hold on. Like, making, creating, <laughs> building, growing, running, everything for th for this program, that sounds like a lot. Well, I mean, I, as OTs, we're all busy. We all, you know, there's, there's OTs who work in school systems who put in way more hours than a typical school day. There's OTs who work in rehab hospitals that are there early and that leave late. If you're doing what you love, it doesn't feel like work. So this is something that is, I'm, I'm, I really enjoy teaching occupational therapy. I really enjoy having a small piece in ensuring a bright future for our profession. And I really do like working with my faculty, working with the students, coming up with new ways to try and teach what we do it's it, it is really exciting. It's something that's br it's brand new. Essentially, we're only accredited not even a year yet, and so there's a lot of things that we can do. It's a small scale program. I have a lot of latitude, so that makes it easier for me to get excited and spend the time doing the things that I want to do because there's it's I don't know. I really like doing it. I really like working with our great students, um, my fascinating faculty. It's fun. So do you? Because you said, you mentioned that you are not doing any clinical work. 
Do you miss the clinical work or, I mean, do you feel like what you're doing right now is like you're calling and you did the clinical work and it's, it's over and done with and this suffices? I, I feel like if I, if I felt the urge or things changed or, I, you know, I could always go back into clinical work. I, when I was working as a field work coordinator and I would go visit students, I would really miss the clinical side. Um, I would miss being in the rehab hospital and the, the sounds, the smells, the alarms going off, the, the overhead pages, the pace. Um, I, I miss that energy. And there are things about clinical practice that I do miss. I think the most significant is the return on investment you get, I guess is one way to put it. If I admitted a student in the beginning of 2017 and they take the classes for two years, they go out there out in field work now, they pass the boards, they are working next year in 2020, and they say, wow, I'm so glad we had this class, or I'm so glad I had a foundation that taught me clinical reasoning and interpersonal skills and to really believe in what's unique and powerful about OT because I see how valuable that is to me in my current setting. I have to wait from when I admit them under, into the program until I get that feedback three or four years later. But whereas when you're working in the clinical setting, you might have someone not able to do a task at the beginning of the session and able to do a task at the end of the session. And bang, that's your reward right there. Mm -hmm. You know, that's your that's your warm and fuzzy feeling. You get that right away. So I think the the time delay, you know, the, you get the immediate gratification oftentimes in working with your clients in a clinical setting. And you don't have that necessarily in the educational side. But what's nice about the educational side that I can't get from the clinical side is just the scale of an influence you can have. One of the things I tell my students at graduation or at a pinning ceremony is, okay, let's say we have 15 students in front of us and each of them sees, when they graduate, each of them sees eight clients a day. There's 40 clients per day times five days a week, that's 200 client interventions per week, times 52 weeks, that's a thousand. And that once and then you track it over the course of a career, you realize you, I'm having the influence I'm having on these future practitioners may influence hundreds of thousands or millions of client interventions and interactions over the course of their careers. So while I may be able to make a significant difference in one client's life one hour at a time working in a rehab hospital, I feel like even though the time frame is different, I feel like I can have a much larger scale of an influence on the future of the profession and on people's lives by working on the educational side. Yeah, I 100% agree with everything that you just said there. And I, I think I think my original question of like, do you miss the clinical aspect is because I'm very much in the clinical world and I'm not in the world of academia yet. Um, there's there's a thought that I potentially might see myself or at least try maybe to get into it later on. I 100% agree with everything that you just said there. And I think my question about like, missing the clinical work was was a little bit of a selfish question because I myself, I'm so kind of in, embedded into the clinical aspect of occupational therapy right now. And I am not in the world of academia. I am a fieldwork supervisor, but that's still like the clinical aspect. And so that's something that I kind of grapple with of if, if, when, maybe, if I do decide to potentially at some point go into academia, would I miss the clinical aspect? Um, or is working with the students and, and working within the school program, like, w would that basically, would that be enough? Like, that's kind of something that I think about. And I love how you said that scale of influence because, yeah, right now I can see one client per hour, however many hours a day, and that's about it. And being able to reach so many more uh, students and future therapists and Oh, I, yeah, like that that scale is just immense. Yeah, and again, I, I really like the clinical work that I did, and I really like the educational piece that I did, and I actually bounced back and forth in my career where I taught at the University of New England for three semesters, 
and then went back and worked clinically at a long-term acute care hospital in Massachusetts, where I had a half supervisory, half clinical role that I really, really liked. I was really happy there because it was an independent hospital and had a great supervisor who was a physical therapist who was an AOTA member and really appreciated OT and really wanted us to do what was unique about OT with our practice. And I mentioned that it was half supervisory, so I was supervising six of the staff, but I also had half a caseload myself. So I was in the trenches with everybody. I was grappling with the the computerized documentation and dealing with that one nurse who was a little cranky and seeing clients right alongside everybody else. So when I had recommendations or you know, I could see more directly what they were dealing with, they could see me modeling behaviors and approaches. So it worked out really well and it was really exciting to have a little bit of both and to feel like I was giving back. And then I got a call from my alma mater at Tufts asking me if I wanted to um, join the faculty as the academic fieldwork coordinator. And when I was thinking about which one I wanted to do, ultimately it was the scale piece that tipped me in the toward going into academia because I really liked having a direct impact on by supervising OTs, much like you're probably getting a, a, a warm and fuzzy feeling by being a fieldwork educator. You're giving back to the profession. You're it, feeling good about it. You're getting to help someone have these aha moments that will help build them a foundation to take off on their own career and influence many, many lives in a positive way. Um, so, but I, I did eventually come down on the side of, I can have a much larger scale impact on the future of the profession if I go into academia than if I stay supervising a handful of practitioners, even though I really like the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think like that's kind of one of the reasons one of the many, but one of the reasons that I love taking students as a fieldwork educator is that, A, I get to expose them. So I work in early intervention and, and do home-based therapy. So I get to expose them to that kind of realm of OT practice, but then also uh, get to share with them my knowledge, my expertise, my passion for OT, and really kind of, I, I like what you just said, like promote the uniqueness of the field. And I love that initial meeting with the students when they come in and they're nervous and they're hesitant yeah. and they don't know what to expect and, and they, they want you as a supervisor to like them. And I, I kind of lay out like the realness of it. All right. Like, this is what you guys are going to deal with. I'm here to support you guys. Like, I'm, I'm here for you, but it's going to be challenging. And then, like, watch their growth throughout their fieldwork rotation. And then I'm also a huge proponent of, like, staying in contact with my students. And when you were kind of telling the story about, like, watching your students go through starting the program to graduating and then starting to work as a therapist, like, I'm getting to see that, too, just from the other, the clinical, like, the clinical role. And right. it's amazing. And I love just watching them go through their schooling graduate, take the board, start practicing. And a fun little story is actually one of my previous students who mainly wanted to do adults, but had to do a, a pediatric or had to do a non-adult uh, rotation. He was with me two summers ago and he just messaged me and was like, hey, uh, he's working in a hospital right now. And he's like, I think I'm going to pick up some side hours in early intervention. And I was like, yay. <laughs> That's awesome, especially because working EI in the home setting can be really challenging. Uh, but it's also it's one of the reasons I really loved home care as a practitioner. I had always been a rehab inpatient guy, but I became so much better as a as an inpatient practitioner after I did home care because I saw what it was really like for these people in their real life context. I'm not pretending that this tub is their tub at home. This is their tub at home. And you have to deal with the unique context that that person is existing in and they're living in, it's it's not uh, it's no longer. And this is what's so great for the students. It's no longer a case study in a in a textbook. It's no longer a, a video they watch online. This is you're in somebody's home, with the real family, with the real client, watching things that are unpredictable. And if you're in the home environment, particularly, you don't have control over whether they have cats, what the lighting is like the things that you see in there, you're on somebody else, you're a guest in someone else's home and you have to be prepared for just about anything. 
while still trying to get the maximum value of your time and your efforts with that particular client and with that family. So that's a great experience for the students to see. And um, so I am obviously as a former academic field work coordinator and particularly as a program director as well, I am so thankful for everybody out there who is working as a uh, field work educator because you don't get paid extra for it. You don't get anything out of it except for that warm feeling in your heart that helping to give back. And the research that we did, we're actually going to be presenting some research at uh, the AOTA conference in New Orleans. And we're going to be talking about, you know, the reasons why people take students and one and the primary reason why people describe that they like taking students, that the benefits that they get are not, I get paid more, I get a free course at the school, um, I need it for promotion or anything like that. It's they want to give back. They want to give back to the profession. They want to get updated on what the latest information is. They want to improve their own practice by teaching another practitioner and doing their clinical reasoning out loud. It's a great experience and it's good for everyone, but it's certainly not easy. It's extra work, it's extra time. But like you described, the results are excellent because we have a bright future of the profession. People who really want to do good work and want to demonstrate what proper, effective, high quality OT is. Those are the people who should be supervising students. And you get that benefit of hearing back from people in a while and hear them say, thank you for your help. I'm now I'm out there and I'm practicing. And I, you know, they tell you about how much they love the work that they do, the clients that they're working with, the setting they're working in. It's, it's a wonderful experience, but you do have to put in the work. And I appreciate you putting in that work. Well, thank you. I, I always do try to like when it when it comes up on the podcast, I really try to start talking about being a fieldwork educator, taking students, because I agree, like it, it's so important and we we need more people, more therapists that want to be educators. And so I'm always trying to promote it and make it where people are like, yeah, actually, I, I, I do want that. Like, I, I like what you're saying there. Yes, I understand it could be more work, but I could definitely I could do it I could see myself doing it and I I love I love what you said about like why we take students and and it's about giving back to the profession but right. for me like it's not even just that I like very early on when I was a brand new grad out practicing I was always within kind of this mentoring model where I was new, my supervisor was mentoring me, but then we always had newer therapists and students coming through. And so I was exposed to it very early on in my career. And so it kind of just became this automatic thing for me. Like, yeah, of course I take students because it was just ingrained so early on. But the the, the big thing that I realized that it's not just giving back and the connections that I make with the students and helping them and furthering their education and everything in that realm. I also realized the benefits that having students, having a new perspective, having somebody else there, what that did for the clients and for the caregivers and almost this whole new world was opened up where like my clients and, and the parents are like, oh, when are you having your next student? Oh, how is so-and-so doing? Like, where are they yeah. now? And it's like this another layer that is just beautiful. Oh, no, I remember being in the inpatient rehab hospitals and having my clients be on their very best behavior because we have a student today. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> like, I've really got to try hard today. I'm like, wait, so what, the last week you didn't have to, but now because, you know, Ashley's here, you have to actually... Like, give it the old college try? Come on, what am I, chopped liver? <laughs> right. But yeah, that's, it, it is, there is a value. And I, it would be great if, and again, I've, I've done research and looking at fieldwork education, and I don't think it's out there yet, but it would be great to be able to show a definitive connection between having students around and client outcomes. Mm -hmm. There's obviously a lot of, that's a, you know, pretty high up the chain, a lot of, um, challenging components to that research but it would be excellent if we could demonstrate that it's not just beneficial for the student who learns it's not just beneficial for the profession which grows it's not just beneficial to the supervisor who gets to articulate their clinical reasoning challenge themselves freshen their practice learn new research get new skills uh, but also it'd be great if we could demonstrate that it's also good for the clients to have more eyeballs on them and more ideas and more creativity. And um, it's just 
you know, more diversity of, of thought being brought to bear on their case. Oh, completely. I mean, I I remember one instance that it was the first time that a student was coming with, with me and I walked in. I had been treating this kid for probably a year or more and did the typical session. Everything went pretty standard, what I'm used to. And we get back in the car and the student looked at me and was like, hey, have you ever considered this? And I just sat there and I was like, no, I mean, I, I did right in the beginning and then I just kind of got plugged into what I was doing. And so I like I should say we tweaked how we were doing therapy based on this one observation that she had seen her very first day. Wow. What's great is your response when the student brings that up, your response was, you know what, you're right. I hadn't thought of that. Let's think about it, which shows that you are engaging in the reflective practice that we re we all should be engaging in to help ourselves do the best quality work we can for our clients. But you were also modeling for that student. It's not about ego. It's not about hierarchy, patriarchy. It's about, I need to do what's best for my client. And if there's another idea out there, wherever the source of that idea comes from, that I should take it into consideration and I should weigh the options and decide, wow, I'll I'm not going to say, well, I'm the supervisor, you're the student, therefore we're going to do it my way. Instead, you looked at it and said, that's a great idea, so let's just use it because it's a great idea. Mm -hmm. And clearly you set up an environment where the the student felt comfortable sharing that with you. So obviously you had established a, a rapport and a relationship with the student so that they didn't feel intimidated or challenged and they felt like they could share and talk to you openly about the your rationale and your clinical reasoning your professional reasoning without feeling like they're challenging you or you're going to be put off by it or anything like that so that's that's excellent yeah i i i want to dive in a little bit deeper into this because i think it's it's so important having that open communication and having that reflective process within when you have students. I mean, you should have it with your clients. You should have it with their caretakers and caregivers and all of that, but also right. with the students as well. And something that I, I, it, it happens all the time. And I really try to uh, just be, be open to it is asking the students, like, what is your, what's your idea? What, what's your, what's your plan? What's your treatment plan for today? What are your activities that you want to do? They'll tell me what it is. And if they come up with something that maybe I myself wouldn't do, instead of saying, you know what, that's that's just a bad idea. Don't do it. I'll tell them, you know, that's probably something I've never done before. And I might actually not do it. But explain to me why you're doing it. And if they have good rationale, I say, go do it. And mm -hmm. more often than not, those activities turn out to be the best activities ever. <laughs> and if I would have just sat there and said, no, that's like, I wouldn't do it that way. So you can't do it. I would right. never see the benefit of these, these outside ideas, these outside perspectives and these new activities. Yeah. Well, that's, I think that's a nature because we're all so necessarily creative in what we do. And we're always thinking, how do we adapt? How do we grade? How do we come up with a new way of doing things? How do I figure out what's going on with my client and use what's unique about them to guide with my reasoning process and my knowledge base where we should go from here? So if you gave a case study, if you printed out a case study for a client of yours and handed it to 10 of your colleagues who work in a similar setting, you'd probably get 12 different treatment plans all of which are going to be tailored to that client, creative, adaptable, gradable, and are going to help that client meet their goals. It doesn't always have to be a beeline. Sometimes it's a butterfly line to get to where we're going. And if we did give 10 OTs a case study and got 12 different plans, all 12 of those plans would probably be excellent and valid and wonderful and enjoyable and effective. So that doesn't mean that each there's like one right way to do it. There may be multiple pathways that'll get you to where you want to go with that client. And you play off of what you experienced that day, what's going on with them, what's going on with you, what knowledge base you have, what was the last research you read, uh, what's going on with a family that's different, what's happening in the context that's different. We're always having to adapt. So 
it's okay, I think, to have these different approaches. And again, being open to the student and say, having them say, well, what about this? Why don't, we, why don't we try butterfly catching today? And you can say, you know what? I don't think I would do butterfly catching with that particular client, but it's not going to hurt them. Let's try it and see if they're up for it. And we've all had wild and crazy treatment ideas like that. <laughs> uh, I had one client who she was going to be going home. She had had a it was a mild spinal cord injury, an incomplete spinal cord injury. And she was, she had small children and I knew that she was going to be going on field trips and she was going to be out with the kids. And I knew that her balance and her endurance were still challenged. So I got clearance to bring her over to the Boston Science Museum on a day when I knew they were going to have a whole bunch of field trips. So it was just going to be loud <laughs> chaos with kids running everywhere. And that was our test to see if, if her balance and her endurance and everything else was really up to speed for her to be able to get back home and dive back into her life. So I don't think that was in Willard and Spackman anywhere, but that was what I thought made the most sense for that particular client. And it worked out great. So sometimes we challenge our clients in ways that they're not expecting or maybe the textbooks don't say is the primary way to approach a situation, but that's, that's OT. Exactly. Yeah, I had I had something similar. We didn't go to the, the science museum, but I had a little a little girl and she was probably about two and a half at the time. But her uh, her family, they really wanted to be able to go out and to eat. That was a big thing in their culture. That was a big thing in their social circle. And this little girl had some sensory issues and would get really overwhelmed and just shut down and start crying and kicking and screaming. And basically the family was not able to go out to eat. And that was a really meaningful occupation for them. And so at one point I'm like, well, let's go. <laughs> where where do you guys want to go out to eat? I'll, I'll meet you there. So I like typically would see this kid at like noon or one. But we switched it up. I went and met them at like 7 p.m. one night and we went out to dinner and I worked with the child in the context of that setting. And I think just just the mom, like being able to observe what I was doing was like, oh, 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 now I can see how to be positive, how to redirect here, what's going on. And all of a sudden, it wasn't an issue after that, after just like one time of kind of going outside and doing something a little bit different. That's fantastic. That's yeah. So they, you actually just went out and modeled, here's the behavior, or here's the modification, or here's the distraction strategy. Because yeah. you, you, could, you could have given them a handout with a bunch of bullet points. Remember, when dining out in a public place, it can oftentimes be helpful to bring distractions such as coloring books or tablets to provide the child with a distraction when they're feeling anxious. But that's not going to have the same effect as you go with her to that setting where the actual issue is occurring and demonstrate, here's how you handle the situation, or here's an adaptation you can try, or here's a strategy you can implement, or you can actually see, oh, I see what the issue is. The issue is actually this, not that. It's not the noise, it's the it's the light source, whatever it happens to be, to help the family get to a solution. But see, this is one of the things that I think is particularly challenging about OT. If you do not have a good sense of work-life balance and don't have a good sense of self-care is in order to do the best quality work we can do for our clients, we often have to get knee deep into their lives. And that doesn't necessarily happen without a cost sometimes. And I'm drawing from my experience when I first started working clinically, I was working in a cancer rehab unit. And so you would get to see people in these really challenging times in their lives and really challenging times for their families. And you'd get to do great work and see amazing triumphs and just incredible miracles happen. And it was amazing and it was wonderful. There were also days that were really challenging and really heartbreaking. And if you divest yourself completely and shut yourself off from the experiences and, the, and what your clients are going through, it's easier for you to maintain your own kind of personal emotional integrity and make it easier for stuff to wash over you or slide off your back. But you're not going to do the type quality work with your clients if you aren't willing to find out what their life is really like. Completely. And yeah, and I, I feel like that's kind of going back to what we were talking about earlier about uh, working in the home. 
that's one of the reasons that I'm so drawn to home-based practice because you get this deeper level of intimacy basically Mm -hmm. with the clients, with their families, with their environments, with their social economic status, with everything. I mean, you, you see it all and it's not, it's definitely not easy. And I know that it's, I mean, it's very taxing on you as a therapist to be able to kind of handle what's going on with the client, with the diagnosis um, disorder, like whatever it is that the typical reason that you are getting your referral for, but then also having to manage all of these other things that now you're getting exposed to and being able to take care of yourself to then be able to provide the best care for your clients. Right. It can be really, really challenging. I mean, I had clients that were my same age, my same name, but had a terminal diagnosis. And I would have to go down there and work with them. And it's impossible not to put yourself in their shoes to a certain extent if you don't have the capacity to do that and still step back and still be intentional about establishing boundaries while understanding what's unique about this particular person's situation, then you're going to have a pretty short career. You're headed to burn out pretty quickly. Not that, not that there are OTs who never, ever experience burnout. I don't think there's any OT who never experiences burnout or compassion fatigue or... If they don't, I want to know their secret. (laughs) Exactly. And I know some wonderful OTs as far as mindfulness goes, and even they have their, have their moments, but it's, you need to be able to, to, you need to, yeah, that's something that I, I try and impart to my students is the challenge of going in, identifying with someone's life situation understanding their values, their situation, their family, everything that's important to them and make a difference in their lives and then jump out, switch channels and do it again and do it again and somebody with somebody different and again with somebody different day after day, week after week, month after month. It's one of those skills that I think you do pick up on field work in part by watching your supervisor, your fieldwork educator, and how they do things or learning from other practitioners in similar settings. We can tell people about how important it is in the classroom, but I think it's one of those skills that you almost exclusively learn from the actual clinical experience, actual practice experience of being out and dealing with real human beings, not just textbooks or video clips. Yeah, I yeah, I think... I had that happen while I was a student on one of my level twos where I ultimately ended up with a client passing away. And this was a client that I had worked with and like reflecting back, I'm sure I had heard about it in school. I'm sure we had had discussions about death and difficulties and the, the steps of grieving and all of this type of stuff, but nothing really hit home until it actually happened clinically Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, what are these, what are these feelings? What are these emotions? What is going on and how do I process this? And I wouldn't have had that unless it had actually happened. It it would have always kind of felt like it's, it's out on the horizon. Like, oh, it's there. I know it's a part of practice, but until I experience it, it doesn't, it doesn't hit home. So do you remember what resources you rely on to get through that? Because I've had clients, I've had had, um, supervisees that had a client die at the hospital. And I remember just walking laps with them around the hospital and processing it out and talking to them until they felt like they were ready to go back in and dive back in with the next client. Uh, Were there family, friends, um, other practitioners, mentors, anybody that you relied on or processed this with? Or did you just go for a run and play Eye of the Tiger really loudly and then go back to work the next day? Great question. Uh, I think initially when it first happened, when I was a student, um, I I didn't really utilize many resources. I, I mm-hmm. think I tried to deal with it internally. And I think it was, what just happened? Okay, now what? And it was more just kind of like, I, I just kind of freaked out and just was like, okay, I'm going to get through it. It's no big deal. It's just this one time. But unfortunately, it has happened a lot more. And every time that it happens throughout my clinical work, I learn a little bit more about how I best deal with something like this. And Mm -hmm. I think reaching out to 
like reaching out to other OTs that understand it or just other professionals that like within the healthcare field, reaching out to just my friends and family, um, definitely reading resources like OT practice. I know that they'll have mm-hmm. articles that will come out about it. Um, if, if you have a good relationship with like professors from school or anything like that, reaching out to people that understand it. And the biggest thing for me, like the kind of the last thing that I realized and I felt like I did right on the last time it happened was I actually was invited and was able to attend the service. Mm -hmm. And it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And it was also the best thing that I needed to have happen for me to be able to support the family and, and get a sense of closure. I think that's kind of the wrong word, but kind of get that sense of, (laughs) okayness <laughs> within my life. Um, I, I appreciate you mentioning that you actually went to the um, funeral services or memorial services for that client. I think that there's probably OTs and other practitioners out there who would say, you know what, that's a boundary. That's too far. Like that's getting into people's lives. That's we're practitioners. We're not supposed to be doing things like that. But I think in a situation where you're that wrapped up in the family's life, they would want to have people who really knew what they were going through celebrate that person's life with them. And it's important for you to process it so you can get some sense that, yes, this is over, but here's what I learned from it. Here's why it was such a valuable experience for me. Um, Here's why I'm thankful for everything I went through, whether it was enjoyable or not, whether it was pleasant or not, whether it was difficult or not. So you need to go through that process because if you don't, it's not like that energy just disappears. If you have those experiences with clients and you don't process it at some point, I don't think it goes away. And I, that, I think that can, it can kind of build up and I, it can kind of make you a little bit more emotionally calloused as opposed to learning the skills for dealing with it, coming up with the strategies and identifying the resources to deal with it so you can experience it fully which allows you to more easily move on the next time. 100%. Yeah. I think really just having that awareness of what can I do so it can help you regardless of what the situation is once you're going through it. And I, uh, I'm going to jump in with a quick home care story. Yeah, do it. Like I said, I, I love doing home care because to me, and I, I hear you echoing it when talking about your practice, that really feels like real OT to me. Like this is somebody's home, this is their life, this is where they do everything that they need to do. I'm not simulating anything, this is their actual life. This is what's important to them, so let's do the real activities that make up their daily life. And so I really, really loved it, and it made me a much better, like I said, a much better inpatient rehab practitioner because it used to be you'd say, oh, we'll just discharge them home, get them some home OT services, and they'll be fine. But then when you see how people are existing and what their environments are like that they're living in and how many resources they really do have and how much time they're alone and what it's like at 7 p.m. versus 7 a.m. for these people, it resets your whole understanding of what needs to be done and sets different standards for your own discharge processing. But I had a client, and we went, I went out to her house. She has, I think, three or four cats, and a, so we worked on pet care. She, that was one of the things that was really most important to her was she was having a lot of back pain and hip pain, and she was having trouble doing basic things like getting the food out for the cats, the water out for the cats, litter boxes, um, things like that. So she wanted to be able to do all these different things, and we came up with adaptations. And I taught her some of the basic things that you teach on body mechanics and ergonomics when someone has low back pain and hip pain. Keep everything at you know waist height. Move bowls and plates and things that you use frequently down to a lower level so you don't have to do so much reaching or stooping or bending. So I recommended that her homework over the long weekend was she would make those changes along with her if her with her if her family was around to help out, they could because she had a nephew in the area, I think she otherwise lived alone with the cats. And so, you know, move everything down so you don't have to do any bending, stooping, reaching, twisting, make life easy on yourself. So I show up the next visit and I'm standing outside the house and, I'm, and it's winter time and I'm like, do I smell something? What is that? Did I step in something? Nope, it's not me. Hmm. I don't know. Well, whatever. 
knock on the door. I go, the door opens and woof, smell hits me. I'm like, what is going, what is that? Oh no. <laughs> well, she had, she had taken my advice and she had moved anything heavy to closer to a, a waist height. So she didn't have to do any bending and stooping. And one of the heaviest items she had to deal with with the cats was litter boxes. <laughs> so she put them up to about waist height. She had had them in the bathroom. She had had one in the kitchen, I think. She had one in one of the bedrooms. But she didn't have shelf space in all those places. But you know what she did have, having an old New England house? Radiators. <laughs> so she put, the, she put the litter boxes up on the radiators because that was roughly waist height for her. The only problem was she was then cooking the dirty litter boxes <laughs> through the weekend. And because, like the like the the frog in the gradually boiling water. She didn't notice it as time goes by, but I certainly noticed it when I showed up. <laughs> I, was, I mean, it was like a cartoon with like the green fumes coming out of the house. So we had to find a different solution for that. I think we found like old chairs and stuff to use instead, but yeah, we couldn't use the radiators anymore because that was, uh, I mean, it wasn't C. diff, but it was, it was not pretty. Well, and cat urine is definitely one of those smells that when it's there, it's there and it's not going anywhere. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Like go home, burn the clothes you did that visit in. It's not going to get better. It's like for two days afterwards. It's like, is that, is that? <laughs> right. It like sticks up in your nostrils and you're like, yeah. I can't, I can't get it out. Yeah. But I, I, I have to admit like A for effort, A plus for effort for your client to go through and listen to what you had to say, take yep. it to heart and then actually do it. And she was so proud of what she had done and it was so much easier and she was having less pain. And she, this seemed like it was great advice that I had given her because everything seemed so much easier. And I was like plugging my nose. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, well, uh, I, you know, we'll find a different solution, but, uh, yeah, it was, it, I'm glad that she <laughs> followed my advice. I just should have been, I'm going to take it on myself and say I should have been a little more precise and say, don't put it on a heating element. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I'm, I'm curious, though, how, because you want the client to still feel empowered and she clearly didn't notice the smell. So how did you approach the yes, good job, but and still make her feel proud of herself, but then also get the point across of like <laughs> what you did is not going to work? <laughs> I think I tied it to we don't want to have the plastic bins on the heating element because we don't want them to get warped or anything else like that. These things can be expensive. You don't want to have it, you know, warp, misshapen, anything like that. So we'll find a different place to put them than up on the heating element. And I can imagine, I bet the cats probably liked having a warm litter box. <laughs> right. <laughs> Happiness is a warm litter box sometimes. <laughs> I think that's going to be on a little, on, a, on like a coffee mug or something. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Well, that's good. So she, I mean, you are, you are able to play it off of like, great idea, but I'm worried about the plastic. Like you didn't exactly. have to actually say like, um, <laughs> I had to put smelly lotion under my <laughs> nose before I walked in exactly. here. <laughs> It's like when I come back next time, I'm bring, I'm just rubbing some Vicks Vapo Rub under my on my top lip before I come in. It's like just breathe those fumes instead. No, I didn't have to do that. No, I could just I could just play it off, and that's that's one of those moments that you have to be creative also in just saying like, how am I going to handle this situation? And again, not in Willard and Spackman. I don't think that was a chapter on how to handle when your client cooks their kitty litter. Yeah, no, no. I I don't think I've read that yet. Uh, if anybody out there has, <laughs> let us know. Yes. I don't think it's in there though. I don't think so. <laughs> it's like real stories or the untold stories <laughs> of home-based <laughs> occupational therapy. <laughs> and and not for nothing. This is one of the things I love about conference is you you go to conference, whether it's state conference, national conference, and you run into OTs, and inevitably things will turn toward crazy stories. Like I'm sure you have crazy stories from. Uh, from from EI and from pediatric practice. We all have these crazy stories, but that's also one of the things that's exciting about what we do is every client's different every day. These challenges, some of which we can't predict, but it makes for really interesting work. How do we solve the problem of this lady's pet care issue? How do we solve the problem of, I don't know, any number of things we run into? And it does make it, it is very entertaining as long as you continue to see the humor in the situation. 
Oh, yeah. Uh, one of the stories that came to mind, and this wasn't even actually working in the home yet. We it was it was over the summer and it was I had two students with me and we were trying to schedule an evaluation. And one of the students, I had them call the it was grandma's number, but I believe it was either mom or somebody else that answered the phone. And the student introduces herself and it's like, yeah, you know, we'd like to set up an evaluation for your for your son. And then the mom on the other line was like, well, this is this is a bad time. Grandma's in the bath and like hangs up the phone. And the student like looked at me and was like, I, well, actually, I think I gave the look. I'm like, so what happened? And she's like, grandma's in the bath. Um, she's like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, wait, what? <laughs> so you should have just played it off and been like, okay, well then obviously that's um that's CPT code seven one four point three six. Grandma, right, not grandpa. Okay, so grandma on the phone seven one three six. So I would just if you would just document that we had a seven point one four three six, um, that would be excellent. Thank you. Right. <laughs> yeah. But Grandma's it was like what uh, uh all right. Yeah. I'm like, is grandma okay in the bath? Does grandma need help in the bath? Like, of course we go into like our OT brain of like, is grandma stuck in the bath? Like, <laughs> Wait, is she in, like, is she on a bath chair or is she right. in the tub? Yeah. Or is she in Bath England? Is right. that, I don't understand. It could be anything. <laughs> Good point. The Bath England, that didn't pop up. I, of course, I was thinking like the negative thing of like, we need to call 911. Grandma's stuck See, in the bath. <laughs> maybe grandma's a world traveler. You don't know. Yeah. How long, how long is bath, uh, how long is grandma going to be in the bath? Like, do we need to call back tomorrow? Come on. <laughs> exactly. How pruny is grandma? Like, let's yeah. check her fingers. Right. Yeah. And so, oh gosh, I mean, there, there are so many stories that, of things that just happen that you don't learn about, you can't read about. Oh, and no. until they happen, you would never oh. even imagine it happening. Oh, I, one more real quick one. I love it. Keep going. It's 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 home care again, of course. So I'm in a, a tough neighborhood of Boston where on one of my very first days, uh, I show up, I knock on the door. I'm supposed to be seeing um, the client who is a breast cancer survivor, and she had had a stroke after that, and she lives with her daughter in this rough neighborhood in Boston. And so I show up first day, and I'm chatting with the daughter, getting some basic information as we get started. And I said, and by the way, real quick question. The holes in the window by the door. What are those from? Is, oh, they're, yeah, they're, somebody fired some shots nearby, and but that was months ago. Hey, okay, cool, great. No problem. Um, so I go back to see the client, and I went back for weeks and doing a lot of work just trying to improve this person's range of motion so that her, our goal was to normalize tone, improve range of motion in the effort to get her doing more with her own self-care because she'd gotten almost completely dependent and we wanted her to be able to do more for herself and make it easier for the family to care for her given the state that she was in. She was just in a back bedroom, mostly just lounging all day and we wanted her to be more active, do more so that it was easier for the family to care for her. So one day I show up, I walk by the, the daughter who's playing video games and um, I'm like, hey, what's going on? She's like, yeah, she's, yeah. And some like, little check engine light goes off about the daughter as I walk by and do my greeting, but I'm busy. I'm thinking about the client. So I go to the back room. I go to work with the client. I'm like, wow, I don't know if I'm working some kind of magic, but the tone is just great. I got more range than we've ever gotten. She's not in any pain. She's not grimacing. She's like, she, you know, says that it, she's not, usually she'll tell me that something's uncomfortable. We can got more range. We can actually try and do some basic hemi dressing stuff. This is great. So finish up with the client, walk back out, I, uh, to tell the daughter, like, wow, what a great day we had. And I look at the daughter, and she looks kind of sleepy and red-eyed. And I said, uh, it seems like your mom was doing great today. Have you guys been doing the ranging that I showed you and some of the other things? And uh, she says, oh, no, no, I just smoked her up. I'm sorry? Yes, apparently she just decided, <laughs> this is before the days of legal medical marijuana, she decided to give mom a few hits, um, and that loosened her up a little bit. So... I said, oh, okay. Well, so Thursday then? All right, great. Well, thanks. I'll talk to you later. I'm like, I don't, what do I do with that? <laughs> yeah. Do I go, thank I'm you? Not gonna go like, call the cops and be like, hey, guess what? My client's arm was much better, and it was because she had some marijuana, right. that marijuana, <laughs> those fancy cigarettes. Um, but <laughs> it was the only time. 
I think I ended up the next time told them, I was like, you can't be using that stuff when I'm here because then I'd have to report it and it's this whole big thing. And they're like, oh, okay, sure. We won't do it when you're here. Okay. <laughs> or Great, just I don't guess. tell me, okay? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or I just won't document it. Yeah. Uh, if you didn't document it, it didn't happen. Yes. I, man, uh, <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> it's one of those things that you're like, oh yeah, like everything's great, everything's so going so good, and then it's just like, zoom, like dagger, and you're like, wait, huh? <laughs> so it wasn't my great NDT. No, yeah. it was, it was pot. Okay, all right then. Oh, so oh it I was that replaced by a, an illegal drug? All right, yeah. great. Yeah. Okay, I guess but, all those years of training. I, but, you know, I feel like, and, and I think, like, w what you were just talking about is that importance of being aware, especially when you're in the home environment. When you're in a facility, like, yes, you have to be aware, but it's a little more controlled and a hospital and that type of stuff. But when you're in the home, you have to be aware of, like, what's happening down the street, what's happening when yes. you park your car, like, who's around, what's happening when you get in the house what do you see within the environment what do you see with your client that you're working with do you see scratches or bruises or anything like that right. or and also like the the other people that are in the house the if it's a child the parents if it's an adult other caretakers maybe a spouse and even though like you're working with the client you're also paying attention to all these other things that are happening and that can give you some insight as to what your client is dealing with right. as well. Yeah. yeah, you've got to have those antennae up so that you can be receiving information and think like, oh, I, why did that interaction between those people give me that OT check engine light? Like, what's going on? And that's something that I think is challenging for new practitioners and for students particularly, is to trust that gut instinct that says something's off, something's different, something's amiss, or and it may not even turn out to be a bad thing, but something is causing me to pay attention at some level to an interaction, a cue, something different in the home, something different about the client. And I, you know, don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to get more information and trust that gut instinct that tells you something's something's up mm -hmm. because you're, you're tuned as practitioners we're tuned to pick up on those cues and we're we've been in enough as an experienced practitioner you've been in enough situations you have confidence to believe that okay i saw that interaction between those two people or i saw the interaction between this new stranger in the house and the client's mom that i've been dealing with all this time what's really going on and feeling confident that there's a way and having the skills or the the techniques, the script to be able to broach those subjects and ask like, well, what's going on or what's happening or what's new or why is this different or didn't you used to have a dog or anything like that? Yeah, I, I, lo I love the script that you just said uh, because I think if you approach it the wrong way, the, the the parents, the caregivers, the caretakers, the client, they could get defensive of like, oh, wait, you, you noticed that? Oh, okay, wait, you weren't supposed to notice that or I don't want you to mm -hmm. know about that. But rather, rather than make them defensive, we really try to just be like, what's going on? Yeah, oh, I noticed you used to have a dog or you moved something over there. You moved like one of the couches or something looks different. What What is that? And I always just try to be really just vocal with with my with the parents and anything that I notice that is out of line I'll like I just try to be like something seems different today oh like there's a scratch have you noticed that there's a scratch on your kid and rather like than point fingers it's more just like have you seen this yet I just want to make sure you see it and then of course they're like oh I haven't noticed it oh no big deal or oh yeah you know his sister got to him or whatever it is but it's really kind of making it where you're not putting them on the defensive and it's more just like hey I'm paying attention and I noticed this tell me what's going on I think you're absolutely right that you, when you present your when, when you're confronted with a situation like that and you feel like you need more information being completely objective and just asking a question and making it very clear that you're not prejudging what's happening or you're not jumping to any conclusions I think you're right. That's the best way to approach it, to just say, hey, what's this? As if I'm just being non-judgmental and being open to to discovering what's going on and just trying to acquire cues because it's part of your reasoning process is the way to approach it, definitely. 
And I think as OTs, I feel like that's something that we do really well and and we learn to do really well. And it's funny because my husband will always, he'll always call me out on this. And I, I'm curious if you're, if you're similar, but when like, if we go out and we're in a, like a group situation and there's multiple conversations going on, as long as they're like relatively within my realm, I can be fully engaged in one conversation, but I can have my fingers in like every other conversation that's happening around me and like know what's going on. And I think it's because of being an OT and having to be aware of I'm working with my client, but what's going on with the family off to the side or what's going on down the street. And it's like, I've learned, I have this like spider web uh, uh, attention where I can just keep anything that's within this realm. Like (laughs) I just, I I know what's going on. And he is like, he'll be talking to just me and can't even (laughs) pay attention to what I'm saying. And he's always like, that is Oh, that's amazing. I don't know how you do that. <laughs> You're just like, yes, honey, we should definitely call them about that this weekend because that leak's not going to go away by itself. And by the way, you know, that kid over there really needs to start using his utensils. And you're like, wait, what, what are you talking about? How? What are you paying attention to? For Completely. me, it's not so much what I'm hearing. It's more observation, like visual observation. My most recent example is from last weekend. So we're, I'm skiing with my... Um, uh, so it's my, my wife and I, our two boys, I'm skiing with my older son, who is five times as fast as I am on skis, and I'm always trying to catch up to him. So we're going down one of the more challenging trails, and we ski by, and there's, every once in a while you see people, like snowboarders, just sitting in the middle of the trail, and you see people just sitting in the snow randomly. So he ski, uh, there's this person who is kind of crouched over on one side of the trail, and she could be like picking up a glove or something, we don't know. So my son goes flying by. I get up next to her and just screech to a halt. I picked up like something, some spidey sense went off. And I check it and complete stranger. I'm just like, uh, are you okay? Do you need anything? And she turns and she's bleeding from her nose. And she has apparently taken a bad fall, but and is says she's okay, but I can tell she's not. So I end up tracking down one of her friends who's nearby. I have her pop off her skis, walk down to him, bring his her skis and poles. I can pretty much tell that she's, uh, I could tell from the way she was moving that she had hurt her wrist. And I so I told him, hey, it looks like your friend hurt her wrist. She might have sprained it. I don't know, but it seems like she can't really do much with it. It doesn't look broken because she can move it around, but she needs some help. You're going to have to help her get down the hill, either flag down ski patrol or just help her take the slowest, easiest way down if she can ski. And complete stranger, but I don't know what it was about just the way she was moving. I'm flying by on skis, and just but just from the way that she was positioned, for some reason, I just ground to a halt and said, up, oh, this person needs help. And somehow I picked up on that. I'm looking at just the beautiful green mountains. It's like this big courier and Ives landscape, and I'm trying to catch up to my older son. But for whatever reason, I picked up on that one cue. I just had that OT hardwired, worked in too many hospitals for my own good <laughs> brain, and just saw, like, up, oh, something's going on. Sure enough, uh, ended up, we get into the lodge a few runs later, and my son says, hey, is that the girl you were helping? And points over at the table, and there she is, and she's got her arm in, like, an ice pack, in this, like, ice pack cast thing, sitting with two of her friends, and seems to be, like, handling it okay, but obviously did hurt herself, but at least she made it back down to the lodge was okay, but I don't know how many other people just, like, went flying by when she was there, but like you with your conversations in the in the restaurant, I just picked up on the visual cue that something's not quite right. So, and does that mean is that something I got because I'm in because of my experience as a practitioner, going back to when I was an orderly in a nursing home as a teenager, or is it people like us with those abilities to pick up cues and empathize with people? Are we more drawn to become OTs? I don't know. Is it a chicken and the egg kind of thing? I'm not sure. Good point. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't have the answer to that either. But I I was going to say like, yeah, I can't imagine how many people just flew by and were constantly going by. Like even as you're talking to her and helping her, like, how many people just kept going down, going, doing their thing and just flying past you and other people wouldn't pick up on that. And I don't know. That's that's a very interesting point. Interesting. Yeah. It's like, are we born to be OTs? Or do we, are people with like a particular type of brain approach, experience drawn to the profession? Or is it something that you could do any, you could be PT, OT, speech, ABA, 
tax collector, who knows, but you just end up in OT and you end up learning these skills. I think I, mm -hmm. I have a funny feeling there's something in our in our makeup or our background that makes us particularly susceptible to skill in occupational therapy, but not sure. Maybe maybe a research project. <laughs> Excellent. Right? <laughs> yes, in all of our spare time. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Easy. We'll, we'll get that done next week. No problem. So... I want to I want to pivot here because yeah. you like me also have a podcast and I would love to kind of jump in and discuss your podcast a little bit. And oh, okay. yeah, maybe you could talk about why you decided to do one and kind of what your focus is. Sure. Honestly, let me see. Where does it start? It starts with Shakespeare actually. So like I, I Everything starts with Shakespeare. <laughs> it all goes back to the bard. Um so I've I've always enjoyed doing theater. I was introduced to it in grade school and really enjoyed doing it. Did some in college, did some community theater after college, then had kids and could no longer say, honey, I've got rehearsal for four hours. So if you can stay home with a baby, that'd be great. I've got to go pretend to be somebody else in another town over with people our age. Hope that's cool. And so we had to kind of put that on hold, but then... My church puts on a musical every year, and the kids got into it. Once they got into it, I had to be there anyway, so what the heck? I'm not going to let my inability to sing or dance keep me out of musical theater. So I got to go up, and I've been doing a show a year for probably seven or eight years now. And then the the producer who puts on the shows sent an email around last summer saying, hey, local theater company is putting on Shakespeare outdoors on the lawn of this historic home in our town, and they're looking for actors if anybody wants to audition. So I showed it to my wife. I was like, dude, I got to do this. She's like, yes, you should totally do this because then we can force the kids to get some Shakespeare this summer. <laughs> so I tried out. I got a part, and I loved it. I loved every rehearsal. I loved the performances. I had never done Shakespeare before. I had never performed outdoors in theater before, but it was fantastic, and I loved it. The only problem was... It ended. So it ends. I'm immediately in a funk. I'm like, this thing that brought me happiness and joy and something that I express my creativity and it's so all-encompassing and so immersive and I get my flow state and this is all wonderful. And I just kind of, it's over now. And when's it going to happen again? I don't know. The church is doing Annie next year. I don't want to do Annie. Man. So I'm in a funk. So I said, okay, I've got to OT this situation. What would bring me happiness? What would bring me joy? What's meaningful to me? I've got to find something else to do that is that helps me scratch my performance itch. And so I started looking around and following for auditions to see if anything else was coming up. Maybe something will come up. Nothing was coming up. Then I went to a faculty workshop, and a colleague of mine, Jackie McDonald, did a presentation on how to do a podcast because she has a podcast. It's called The Inside Track. She does ABA, and she has, this, she has a successful podcast, and she's one of my favorite people here. So I talked to her afterwards. I'm like, what, how, what, what's involved? That sounds great. Like, I could do a podcast on OT. That'd be a blast. I would just talk about OT for a while, and I would get my, get my uh, performance itch scratched. And so she talked me through how does she get it set up? How does it happen? What do you do? And I gave it a try and really enjoyed it. So it's only been, I'll be recording my seventh episode. It's fun. Oh, wait, hang on a second. I'm just saying hi to a student. <laughs> I'm, how are you, Krista? No, it's okay. I'm being interviewed for a podcast from California. Hi, Krista. <laughs> uh, Sarah says hi. Sarah from OT4 Life says hi, Krista. Okay, so, so, so she, she says hello. She's one of our awesome students who's out on level two right now. Oh, yay! <laughs> oh, you're picking up your, your Yeti cup. I know, I know. We had orientation yesterday. Should have been there. Oh, my gosh. I literally, because this is week two, so I had to pod and everything I kept doing. But that's, no, no, no. You're, you're focused on your clients. That's all that matters. Take care of yourself, though. You know how challenging this is. Okay, you're, well, don't, remember, remember what one of the most famous OTs in the world said do or do not there is no try do you remember who said that no. yoda oh, and he was the most famous. one of the most famous yes he was the only dual ot jedi master yeah of course yeah of course <laughs> good to see you too all right Bye. keep doing well sorry sorry i'm sorry students come first yeah you're good um 
I, lo- I love I was just like I'm a little fly on the wall I love this this is fantastic <laughs> no Chris is Chris is fantastic that's again when you're it's when you hand select each one of your students then you know they're all going to be excellent um, yeah. I, I interview every student that's interested in our program so I get nothing but top-notch kids um so so yeah I talked to uh, talked to Jackie McDonald and she talks me through the process and I set it up it's only been going for six episodes so far I have, I'll be recording my seventh in the next couple of days and it's on virtual reality I'm all excited about it but each time each week that pops up I try and put one out every couple of weeks and I don't even have a big schedule out three months in advance or anything I'm not organized like you I just like what interests me in OT this week you know what interests me virtual reality or something will just I'll notice something or the kids will be doing something or I'll be skiing and I'll think you know what adapted sports I'll have to do that one there's so much interesting stuff going on in our profession that there's always something new to talk about and all I'm doing is finding something I'm interested in in our profession and then finding some recent research to describe it so that we can celebrate what is really super cool about OT and ultimately that's what this is about it's just I enjoy sharing what I love about the profession that I love. I enjoy celebrating what's so exciting about it. I think if we all recognize and everybody gets interested in how exciting and how different and how varied and how surprising our profession is, it's not just evidence-based and science-driven. It's also exciting and interesting and it's glue guns and virtual reality and stuff happening halfway around the world. And what's really interesting that they're doing you know, in Korea with stroke rehab that we're not doing in Oklahoma. It's, there's so much going on. There's so much fascinating stuff that if I can get people interested and kind of refresh everybody's sense of wonder about our profession on a regular basis, then I'm happy. It works for me. It works for everybody out there that is willing to take four and a half hours out per episode. No, take a few (laughs) minutes out for every episode. (laughs) <laughs> whatever, how, whatever they, how, whatever portion they want to listen to, so you do what you want. It, it, it again, it's spreading the word about what's really interesting and and wonderful and miraculous about a profession and getting people excited about what OT is. I love what you just said there. Love, I love what you just said there because I think that's a big reason as to why I started this podcast, and I think it's such a brilliant platform to be able to express passion and meaning and purpose and (laughs) really highlight what who we are and what we do as occupational therapists which I think within the field everyone has a really good grasp of what they do and what we do but when it comes to outside of that I, I think a lot of people are like oh I know an OT and they work in schools or I know an OT and they do hospital rehab or they do home-based pediatrics right but mm-hmm. there's so many different avenues and there's so many cool things within our like within our realm but then also like you said going outside to other countries and what they're doing and how they're mm-hmm. addressing things and the research that's coming out and I I love how you integrate research into your episodes and I love just the variety that you have in your episodes that's like I mean you've gone from medically fragile pediatric OT mm-hmm. to like OT in Africa and like yep. just kind of all over the place. And I definitely want to point out that, well, A, everybody should go listen to your podcast because I think it's oh, brilliant. But uh, your most recent episode at, at the time of this recording was the one that I just mentioned, the OT in Africa. Mm-hmm. And there are definitely some hidden gems that are throughout <laughs> that entire episode. So you're going to want to listen to the whole thing because I, as I was listening to it, I was like, this is amazing. I love it. I had the song stuck in my head for the rest of the evening. <laughs> that's excellent. Yeah, that's, it, there's no reason why it can't be fun. And uh, it, it's, it, it's fun to do and let, let's have fun with it and let's celebrate it. And yeah, that's my, my goal is people, a whole bunch of people listen to it and each person who listens to it here's my little snippet about a bunch of different interesting things in OT and decides to go investigate it themselves. And you can go read up on OT in Africa if you work in home care in Tuscaloosa. You can read you can listen you can go look at what people are doing the history of OT in theater even if you're a CHT and you spend your whole day with, you know, thermoplastics. 
but that doesn't mean you can't you know enjoy what's really interesting about our profession and get excited about it and broaden your your horizons and you know stay curious i think that's what i i just want to help us all you know help encourage all of us to just stay curious about what's out there in ot and discover what's new and interesting it'll help us all have long and happy careers i think i yeah that th- those two words stay curious like wow that's powerful i yeah like that's absolutely amazing and i think i think too it's like just kind of planting the seeds of what OTs are doing out there. And there's new things popping up all the time. And even if it's something that you're not even interested in, but just getting that exposure, getting that knowledge of, wow, there are OTs that are working in that area. I didn't realize that. Because Mm -hmm. you never know when you might get a client or you might be a fieldwork educator, you get a student that's interested in X, Y, and Z, or a friend or somebody that pops into your world that has an interest in that area. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, hey, I was listening to a podcast and they were talking about this. You should go check it out and then you'll get more information on it. Right. And you can, and maybe it isn't something that's directly related to your area of practice, but it might be, it'll make, it'll just trigger a different way for you to approach a situation in your own practice because you've broadened your scope, you've broadened your lens a little bit. Um, because yeah, there's so many crazy and wonderful things going on out there. I mean, I know OTs who have trained capuchin monkeys to be um, to assist clients with high-level spinal cord injuries. Um, I have an OT on my faculty who ran away and joined the circus, and she now has a private practice doing circus arts with breast cancer survivors. And she's presented, you know, World Federation, AOTA, about circus and OT. Yeah. I mean, we, 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 there's so much out there that is OT. Um, one of the things that I was exposed to over the summer that I thought was really, really interesting was a brand new technology, not brand new, but I mean, maybe a couple of years old. It's this group in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and it's called Brain Power. And what they do is they, they use Google Glass, which is, you know, the Google Glasses mm-hmm. they, for augmented reality. When you look through them, you see an overlay over what you would normally see of whatever computer images they've generated. So they use it to, they use it to gamify improving social skills and eye contact for kids with autism. If you look through the Google Glass and it has a little target, it imposes a target over what you see. And if the target picks up a face and you attend to that face for five seconds, then bloop, this little Snapchat filter type, you know, um, like all of a sudden that person has dog ears when you look through the glasses. And then if you hold on for another 10 seconds, bloop, now they have a pig's nose. Oh, that's hilarious. And it's training the kids to improve eye contact to help with social skills and communication. It's an adaptive technology, but it's something that didn't exist five years ago, 10 years ago. And it might be you know, blase 10 years from now. But I see things like that. I'm just like, what would possibly, there's so many ways that even though I don't work with that particular population and I don't necessarily have three, four, five thousand $5,000 to invest in one of these for my own personal use, what, what else could we do with that? And I think, as, again, as we stay curious and start thinking about what, observe what's going on in OT and think how it would apply to what I'm doing in OT and see the commonalities because you know, these common threads run through all the different practices because we all go back to the same powerful idea about meaning and individualized intervention. But, you know, what do I, what, what can I observe about the world around me in OT and how can I use that information to make my practice and the lives of my clients better, even if it means trying something new, even if it means being open to an experience that otherwise wouldn't be open to? I, and I feel like even just mentioning those types of things to like your students in the classroom mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden somebody's going to be like wait I love doing acrobatic type stuff and I love the circus I, I didn't even realize that I could tie OT into that or I really like monkeys wait hold on a second <laughs> this I can I can make this work and all of a sudden it just like opens up that again I'm going back to that unique power of occupational therapy Amen. <laughs> to, to be whatever you want it to be Right. I just did my own quote there, Michael. (laughs) (laughs) You got the title of your podcast now. That's perfect. Um, So I feel like I want to keep talking, but I know I probably got to wrap this up so you can get back to whatever you had going on. I do need to get home. I need to to do my own IADLs. I got to go pick up groceries, cook dinner, 
before my son goes to swim team. So perfect. Well, I'll wrap it up. I just have a couple, couple little ending closing questions for you. Mm -hmm. Um, the, I know the name of your podcast is I love OT. Yes. What is it that you love about occupational therapy? Wow. Um, I think it's, it's almost like the idea of OT is what I really like because the idea, the, underpinning philosophy is that by making these connections and finding out what's unique about someone and tapping into what motivates them uniquely, that that has a power to achieve things and make people capable of doing things that maybe they even they didn't know they could do. Even though I'm right down the hall from nuclear medicine, I don't think that that nuclear energy is the most powerful thing in modern American healthcare or healthcare around the world or in education around the world. I think it's the power of meaning and tapping into what is meaningful to people because that can make pain disappear. It can make people overcome physical, mental, psychosocial, psychological, social, virtual barriers in their lives. So the idea of being able to harness that power in a meaningful way that directly improves people's lives and restores quality of life, function, and independence. If you get to do that, it's a privilege. And it's amazing. It's like you're being a superhero on a regular basis. And yet you get to go home and you don't have to have a secret identity. I love that answer. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So like a solid B plus is what you're saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. B, 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 between B, B, B plus, I'd say, yeah. Right. Okay, good. Still got graduate school credit then. As long as it's above exactly. B minus, I'm fine. Okay. That was a really long answer. So now I'm going to I'm going to make you think. And this is a question that I ask about time. <laughs> I know. Haven't made you think this whole time. Just just for the last minute, all right? That's all okay. we got to do. All right. And I do this for all my guests. This okay. is the last question here. Well, I have a question and then I have like a request, a little ask at the end. But if you only had one word to describe occupational therapy, what would it be? One word to describe occupational therapy. <laughs> Let me see. I don't want to do anything cheesy. Oh, we've had a lot of cheese on this show. Don't worry. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's we're going to keep the Velveeta <laughs> out of this. One word to describe occupational therapy. Okay. Powertivity. Ooh. Powertivity. Powerful. Creativity. Powertivity. Print you the just, t-shirts. <laughs> you just made up your own word. <laughs> I did. I did. I took I took the wealth of my experience and I created something new out of it that's unique based on the interaction that we've had. It's very OT. That is the real OT right there. <laughs> there it is. That okay, well that's a first. I haven't had that word yet. Um See? and I've had people try to give me two words or three yeah. words. No, but I've never had somebody just combine it into one I just word. Made up an, an OT portmanteau right there on the spot. Uh, yeah, I, I think that might be the title too. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. We'll let uh, Willard and Spackman know about that powertivity. That should definitely be a chapter in their their newest edition. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I think that's that's something we're gonna have to work into the next domain and framework. All powertivity. Right. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> All right. So one more thing before we get going, if yeah. people want to learn more about you, listen to your podcast or just get in, get connected with you, how, how can they find you? Um, I, you can find me through Regis College, uh, their website, regiscollege.edu. Um, just type my name in and, and check that. You can see me on LinkedIn. You can follow OT Daddy on Twitter. The podcast is available on Google Play, on iTunes, on Spotify, on Stitcher. Just search for the I Love OT podcast or watch the OT Daddy Twitter feed. And then I usually send out links or a reminder before I send out a new episode. So find it wherever you can. Uh, again, I would just love to see as many people as possible seeing it, enjoying it, and getting something out of it so that their practice is that much more enhanced and that much more enjoyable on a regular basis. Drop me a five-star review if you get a chance because it helps more people find us well, and I will be at the AOTA conference presenting a poster too so don't be afraid to look me up there and swing by the poster session and I will gladly talk to anybody about OT at any time anywhere. 
And I highly, highly recommend anybody taking a listen to your podcast. It's super inspiring. I've loved everything that I've heard so far. And I'm excited. I just found out you're going to AOTA. I'll be there too. So we'll definitely have to meet up there. Absolutely. Absolutely. We'll have to get everybody together. That would be fantastic. I love that idea. Well, thank you, Michael. This has been just a, such a wonderful chat. I have really enjoyed just kind of sitting down and this has been an absolute pleasure. I know you are busy, busy. See, I just, I just made my words. Woo. Very and busy. I know. <laughs> I know you're a very busy man and you have a lot of stuff on your OT plate and your personal plate too. And so I really just appreciate you taking the time to sit down and share your experience, share your wisdom, share some of your singing with us. Um, (laughs) This has been absolutely fantastic. So thank you. My pleasure. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you and, um, I've enjoyed listening to your podcast as well, and it's great to expand the network of people who are out there celebrating what OT is. So look forward to seeing you uh, at AOTA and seeing everyone else at AOTA, all 10, 12,000 of our closest friends that will be there. It's going to be a lot of fun. So thanks again for the opportunity. I've really enjoyed speaking with you. Hey, before you go, I just wanted to say thanks for listening to today's episode. If you want to further the discussion, go to our website, otforlife.com, and join our Facebook group. If you like us, here are three easy ways to let us know. One, share our podcast with a friend, colleague, or anyone interested in occupational therapy. Two, leave us a review on iTunes or anywhere this podcast is found. Three, subscribe to us so you don't miss out on any upcoming episodes. Thanks again. We'll catch you next time, OT for Lifers. And we're done. Yeah, and we're done. And oh, we're clear. We're we're good. Oh, I can finally yeah. go back to my regular accent. Uh-huh. Oh God. Uh-huh. I can't believe. Oh jeez. <laughs> oh my God. I gotta go back in the car. I got traffic I gotta beat to get home. I gotta go get on ninety five and gotta get home. I gotta get dinner ready. I gotta go to the star market. I gotta get groceries. I gotta oh. Oh, I had there was something else I was gonna mention and now I got sidetracked. What was I going to say to you before we started? You'll <sighs> think of it. Just you'll, you'll be you'll be brushing your teeth tonight. And you go, oh, oh. Ah. I I still don't know what it is. Oh, it's going to come to oh, me good. like ten years. I'm going to be like, that's, that's it. Me too. Great. That's, <laughs> right? It's infectious. Thanks. Yeah. Um, all right. So oh, that's going to bug me now too. <laughs> Do you have a song for that? Um, don't worry <laughs> about a thing. Every little thing's going to be all right. Perfect. That's what I was hoping you were going to say there. (laughs) It's necessarily very creative. What's my point here? I had a point. (laughs) That's okay. Much like like my old pencil, I had a point. Um, Uh But, um... (laughs) (laughs) Um, Oh, no.